Simon Hudson is the executive director of CoData. CoData is um, the collaboration for open scientific data. And with this background, he sits in so many steering committees, boards, uh, working groups, all related to open research data and open science. And it's really a great pleasure to have you here, Simon. Welcome, and the stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. My apologies, and um, thank you very much to Andre Goliath for the, for the invitation. Um, Andre has been working on an expert group um, as part of the OECD Global Science uh, Forum, um, which I'll mention um, later in the presentation. And thank you very much for Muriel for all her help um, with the organization. My apologies for speaking in English. Um, I'm not a mono monoglot English. I speak French, I live in Paris, I speak Spanish, but it's sprechen nicht Deutsch. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about open data, open science, and fair data. I hope you're familiar with the concept of fair data, the idea that data created by research and for research should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I'll spend some time on those concepts. I'm going to talk about data produced by research and for research. And I hope that's an important, I think that's an important contribution to our discussions about open data. Sometimes I fear that the research side of things, data created in universities, data created by large data collection activities for research, is sometimes a bit neglected in the open data movement, which is very concerned with open government data, transport data, smart cities, etc. There's a considerable investment in data created by research and for research, and it is an investment which is not exploited to its maximum potential, because the data is largely unavailable and unusable. Um, <clears throat> so that's the preface. A quick introduction to my organization. CoData is the Committee on Data of the International Council of Science. So we were established some time ago, some 50 years ago in fact, by the International Council of Science to act as, if you like, an arm's length organization to promote the availability and the quality of data. And over that time, our mandate has shifted. Originally it was to publish data tables and to be concerned about the accuracy of reference data. Now our strategy really focuses on these three areas. We do a lot of work on data policies. I'll mention a little bit of that later. We do work under a category that we call frontiers of data science. And a lot of that is technical issues, scientific issues, and standardization issues around data. And we do a lot of capacity building and training. Now, I made the decision to speak less about capacity building and training in this talk, but I'll be very happy to answer any questions about co-data activities and our training activities in particular um, at the break or at lunch. I wanted to mention some of the arguments in favour of open science and fair data, but then move on quickly, because I, I, I hope the participation, the audience in Open Data Switzerland, you're familiar with many of these arguments, and I'd be speaking to the converted. But I just want to mention three things. Firstly, that the availability of data, the availability of data that underpins scientific or research findings is fundamental to the scientific method. And the president of CoData, Jeffrey Bolton, argued in this, this red-covered report um, a few years ago 
produced by the Royal Society, science as an open enterprise, that essentially if you do not publish your data at the same time as you publish your results, it's not really doing science because there isn't the verification, the transparency, and the possibility of reproducibility. Also, if we look at the last 10 to 15 years, 20 years even, those research areas that have leapt forward, that have made the most progress, are those where there have been open data agreements. Genomics, astronomy, any research area that uses remote sensing data, and there are many, many uses of remote sensing data which is available from Landsat or from Copernicus, etc. Those areas of research that have been transformed have been transformed by open data agreements. And the availability, for example, in genomics of the BLAST, the, the, the algorithm that allows life scientists to search across many different genetic sequences to find comparisons or to, make, or to perform their analysis. Research has been transformed by the open availability of data. I'm, I'm sure you know that. And also, it's not just about the research sector, it's about the use of those research findings in broader society. And this is, I think, is where the research data community and the broader open data community need to connect and need to connect more. So, in recognition of that, there has been over the past 10 to 15 years a considerable policy push for open data. I just list some of the, the key policy statements there, and some of which CoData has contributed to a great deal. On one level, from a policy perspective and from a science perspective, there should be no further debate. And so I wanted to discuss in this talk, okay, given this case, given the case for open data in research, given the policy statements here, how do we get to this new form of doing science, to open science? How do we make open data, open science, and fair data a reality? So that's the theme of the talk. CoData, for the International Council of Science, for our parent body, produced a report um, about 18 months ago now, entitled Open Data in a Big Data World, intended as a policy statement for the members of the International Council of Science and for an aligned organisation, um, the International Social Science Council, which in principle will be merging with the International Council of Science. And that, that report lays out a vision for the conduct of research internationally based around open data, the idea that data should be open by default, the data should be intelligently open or fair, and it lays out a set of principles and, um, and enabling practices. That, is framed, that report is framed as an accord. Um, I, I commend it to Open, open Data Switzerland. I'd, I'd be very keen if participants or members of Open Data Switzerland could look at that, and we invite endorsement of the principles and the enabling practices laid out there. One of the things we stress in that document is the complexity and the scale of the challenge before us. And although we use this diagram, the open data iceberg, to present that, but although the technical challenges are significant, they're indeed the the top part of the iceberg, the, the, the smallest part that you can see above the water. And in fact, below the waterline, there are other major organisational, social and cultural challenges which need to be addressed. The ecosystem challenge, by which we mean how do we organise the network of data repositories, the network of standards organisations which are necessary, and training and education. Funding support in research institutions, the development of skills, and perhaps most importantly, the incentive challenge in the research domain and the mindset challenge, changing the culture of research. 
to one where there's absolutely no question as to whether you would share your data when you publish your research article. There's no question whether having invested many thousands of Swiss francs in a given research project, you would even consider not publishing or making available the major data set that is created by that work, even if you haven't quite finished the research that you would like to do on that. So these cultural issues. So these are the five areas that I want to go through in the remainder of the, the presentation. Um, what I see is the major challenges and the major areas of action to make open and fair data a reality. We need to clarify the boundaries of open, particularly for research data. We need to refine and improve understanding of what fair data means, what we need to do to make data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We need to work with and across disciplines on standards and vocabularies so the data is interoperable and reusable. We need to invest in data infrastructures, and I'll say a little bit about the OECD report under that heading. And we need to consider incentives and recognition and reward for researchers that do share their data. <coughs> Boundaries of open. The policy statements to which we refer always say that data should be open by default. It's amazing how difficult it is to communicate that simple message sometimes. If I had a Swiss franc, and I know the Swiss franc is extremely uh, valuable at the moment, particularly compared, compared to the, um, the British pound. If I had a Swiss franc for every time I give a talk and someone says, aha, but have you thought about private information? We can't share that. That can't be open. Of course, open by default means that the default of it is open unless there is a very good reason not to share. The European Commission recently has pushed this mantra as open as possible, as closed as necessary. The devil is in the detail, and there's still a lot more work to be done to clarify that detail. But as a statement of principle, I think that's very clear and very sound. As open as possible, as closed as necessary. When we say open by default, when we say research data should be open, we mean that it should be open as possible, as close as necessary. There are good reasons for not sharing all data. Personal information, some commercial information, some security information, and public good information as well, when the data might um, indicate the location of the last breeding pair of a given endangered species. We do have to take these into account. But there is a lot of research data which can very readily be shared and which is not and which should be. But there is a major task in front of us if we believe the data should be open by default to clarify these boundaries and to make it clear what data can be shared and what data should not. That's the first point. Second point is expand what we mean and clarify what we mean by fair data. Here's the basic definition. Findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And there's a little definition of those, what we mean by each of those, those subheading headings there. What's interesting about fair is that it repeats a mantra or a number of things that have been mentioned in reports on open data or open research data in particular for a number of years. But it has that genius of putting it into an easily remembered acronym and aligning it with um, a moral principle. The data should be fair, should be open, and it should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We said very similar things in the Royal Society report, and that was taken up by the G8 science minister's statement. Um, they're up there um, somewhere. It's discoverable, accessible, accessible, inter intelligently usable. But these are driving at the same things. It's not a ju enough just to dump your data on the web 
and hope that people will understand it. Some people will argue that that's a good first step. I think in lots of areas of research it's simply not enough. And it's important the data should be sufficiently well described for it to be actionable, for it to be understood, for people to know how they can use it and integrate it with their, with their own data. So the EC, the European Commission, have, has published a guidance on this and um, they established um, at the beginning of the year an expert group which I'm chairing. And what I'd like to ask really from, from this group and from the open data movement more generally is for input to that report. Um, there's a call for suggestions and contributions which will be open until um, the end of July. Um, and if you follow that bit.ly link for the consultation, you'll find further um, information about the questions that we're asking for, for input. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over these, this further detail about, about FAIR, but they're, they're there for reference. These are the definitions which are taken from the scientific data article which was published, um, I think, uh, during the course of last year. But it indicates some of the areas um, to uh, the definition of, um, of, of fair guide, guiding principles. Um, that to be findable, you need um, a persistent identifier to uh, similarly to be accessible. That to be interoperable, you need sufficient metadata and agreed uh, vocabularies. To be reusable, you need at the very least an open license and other contextual information. But it's expanding those definitions, which is the task of that expert group, and which, for which we'd be very grateful for your input and suggestions. In order to meet the challenge of interoperability, this is the third point that I wanted to cover, we need to work with research disciplines, and we need to work across research disciplines to identify standardised vocabularies for particular concepts, for the things that we are measuring, so that we know when experiment X has measured a thing and experiment Y has measured a thing, they are genuinely talking about the same thing, and that the findings of the data can be interoperable. It's a very simple concept, but it's very <laughs> difficult in many circumstances to put into, put into practice. Something that we're doing with CoData and with uh, the International Council of Science is preparing a commission on data, for, on data standards for science. The International Council of Science, one of the things it does, it acts as the parent body or the umbrella for international scientific unions. Those organisations which internationally represent a particular area of research. For example, the International Union of Crystallography or the International Union of Geophysics and Geodesy. They represent internationally and stand for and promote that particular area of research. And as such, in some instances, they are the guardians of the concepts which that research area uses. So the International Union of Crystallography looks after um, the crystallog crystallographic information format by which data in that area of research is shared. Similarly, the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry looks after concepts relate and definitions of particular concepts related to chemistry. We observe that not all of those international unions perform that role. And if we are to achieve genuinely interdisciplinary research, not only do we need organisations that look after those standards, but we need a dialogue between the organisations that look after standards in one discipline and in another. All the areas of research that are of global significance, whether that's climate change, the expansion of cities, um, biodiversity, the interface between humanity and the planet, require the integration of data from many different sources. And to achieve that integration, we need interoperability, and to achieve interoperability, we need dialogue between the organisations that look after standards and vocabularies. This is a small initiative in its inception. There's a link there to um, some presentations from the workshop we held last week. Um, 
but I think it might be of broader significance. And we hope that it will lead to a decadal in initiative as an International Council of Science program to promote interoperability across research domains. In the interest of time, this is a project that we did using that approach um, for a uniform description system of, uh, for nanomaterials, getting researchers who look at nanomaterials from different domains to work together and to agree a uniform description system. There's information on the slide deck which may be of interest. I saw uh, my time flash up, so I'll uh, move quickly on to the issue of the sustainability of data infrastructure. We need to invest in data infrastructure. At the moment, data is not managed in a sustainable way. It's not managed in a reusable way. Much data which is produced in research institutions remains in those institutions on external hard drives, on local servers, and by and large is not available for re reuse. To achieve a world in which we support research in the way that we have supported it in the past decades, supported, in, the past, in the past centuries rather, we have invested in libraries and research institutions that look after knowledge. We need now to invest in those institutions that look after data. So we need to make the case. This is one document that attempts to do that. And we need to ensure that those institutions that look after data in the long term are sustainable. With the arrival of open data mandates and policies, with the need to look after data in the long term, we need to consider what proportion of the science budget nationally and internationally needs to be invested in those institutions. But as well as that, it's not just about the... And, and as part of that argument, we need to think that looking after data in the long term, making it available for reuse, is part of the cost of doing research. Just as we consider publishing research articles as part of the cost of doing the research, so looking after the data effectively during the research project and making it available for reuse is part of the cost of doing the research. So we need some form of allocation. And we also need to consider how those institutions that look after data in the long term can be funded effectively for sustainability. That was one of the tasks of the OECD project, um, which I was co-chairing and which Andre was, uh, was, was a member. And that really looked, um, it started from the position that there was very little work that was done on the economic sustainability <coughs> of those organisations, those data repositories that look after the research data in the long term. So looking at that gap, we surveyed roughly 50 data repositories, and we asked these questions. How are data repositories currently funded? What in innovative income streams are available for data repositories? What means of optimizing costs are available? How do income streams currently um, match willingness to pay of various stakeholders? It's not just a matter of providing a bulk grant from central government. Sometimes there are complex ways in which these organisations receive their funding. Sometimes they draw funding also from the private sector. But if we have an open access mandate, that removes at least one of those opportunities of charging for access. So we need to consider what ways of paying for repositories there are. I don't have time to go into detail of all those different ways of, of paying, but I commend that report to you. Um, it will be available by the end of, 20, of, of 2017. But one thing I can share for you is this diagram, which uh, you can sort in more detail later, which indicates the ways in which data repositories can develop <coughs> their business models, starting from a value proposition, considering about their stakeholders, their source of funders, their product. And although it may seem an obvious thing, that an organisation that needs to survive, that needs to be sustainable, that looks after something that's in the interest of the public good, needs to develop a business model. This work has not been done in this sector. 
and I think that this report, therefore, is a pretty significant contribution to an ongoing debate about how we fund and sustain the data infrastructure. Last slide. I'm not going to say a lot about um, motivations and rewards. It's fundamental. As I mentioned earlier, we need to change uh, the culture uh, by which science and research is conducted and to integrate the idea of making data available with the process of scholarly communications and the reward and recognition that we receive for that as researchers. Data citation is part of this, and also I think is a change in the way that we provide funding and that we acknowledge the scientific contribution of research, researchers and research institutions. And I guess the last message is that research performing institutions and research groups increasingly, we talk about research intensive universities. In the next 10 to 20 years, we will be talking about data intensive research groups and universities. Um, those institutions will build their prestige around their ability to look after data in the long term, to analyse those data, and to make data collections available to the world. And we've done a lot of work on data citation that may be of interest. Ah, sorry, I forgot about this. Co-data 2017, St. Petersburg in October. Um, covering lots of the issues that I've covered, interdisciplinary research um, questions, the relationship between data and um, global challenges, global challenges and data-driven science. Please look at the content of that, uh, that conference and it might be of interest. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Sam. That was great. Um, but have you thought about private information? <laughs> no, I, no that, wasn't, that wasn't my question. My question is, um, how well is Switzerland doing in terms of fair data? And what are the next steps Switzerland needs to take from your point of view? Um, that's a very challenging question because I'm not intimately um, familiar with the whole Swiss, Swiss context. I do know that... Um, the economics advisor on the OECD report, John Houghton, is doing a study of the Swiss Bioinformatics Institute. Um, so there's, I know that there's consideration about that. I was also the external advisor on um, the review process for um, open data activities in Swiss universities. So I was aware from that process that there was a number of projects to develop coordination across Swiss universities. And that looked, um, at least on the face of it, very much significant steps in the right direction. Um, Switzerland is not a member of CoData, so um, I would, uh, I, I, will <laughs> I will invite that participation and um, I'll, I'll be in touch about that. And um, you know, we would hope that that, that, would, that would help. So, so that could be the next step Switzerland could take to become a member of CoData. Thanks a lot again, Sam Hobson.